was that last training camp, watching Kyle Rudolph, who just got cut by the Giants, he thought that he could beat him in a race. <laughs> it's like, this is one of the slowest players I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, Hello, and welcome to episode 349 of the official Establish the Run.com podcast. My name is Adam Levitan. As always, joined by Evan Silva. Combine is behind us. We already talked about some of the stuff Evan saw. We have some wild things going on in the NFL that we need to talk about. Saquon Barkley on the block, CMC, Christian McCaffrey on the block, Calvin Ridley, hashtag one of us. Evan, good afternoon. Good afternoon. On today's show, we're going to talk about some of those reports and rumors revolving around mostly running backs and quarterbacks that were swirling around the NFL combine, entire NFL was there talking to each other. You get a lot of rumors and a lot of reports out of this stuff. We also have some of the impressive or needle moving one way or the other combine performances to talk about. Before we get into it, I want to remind everyone of this ridiculous deal we have with BetMGM going. If you want an $85 off coupon to use on any ETR product over the next one calendar year, all you have to do is make a $10 bet as a new customer on BetMGM. They'll send you that coupon for $84.99 off any ETR product. And also you will get $1,000 in free bets. The way you do this is using our link. You have to head to the betting tab on the site. Sportsbook bonus offers page has the link and the details you need to collect that coupon. Take advantage of it. It's insane right now what sportsbooks are doing to try to acquire customers. Speaking of sportsbooks, I guess we have to leave with this Calvin Ridley thing. I mean, this was about five or 10 minutes before we came on to record this podcast. So we don't have fully developed thoughts here yet of course the background on the calvin ridley thing is that he set out all of last season for mental health okay cool this doesn't really have anything to do with that but now it comes out today march 7th that he has been suspended one full year for betting on nfl games after he quit the falcons last year calvin Ridley's response on twitter he tweeted at 2 p.m mountain on march 7th which i'm sure he'll delete but he wrote i bet 1500 total i don't have a gambling problem. Of course, the memes are going crazy. Hashtag one of us, Calvin Ridley. I don't have a gambling problem. I have a winning problem. Hashtag Calvin Ridley. Um, it's going to get him, you know, obviously we don't think it's a big deal. I think mm-hmm. it's a big deal if he compromised games. I think it's a big deal if he's playing in games that he bet on. It's not the end of the world otherwise though, but man, you know, it's, I get why the NFL has to take a really hard line here and suspend them for a full year and maybe more because you just can't have any sense that the games might not be on the up and up. So Mm -hmm. not great for Calvin Ridley, not great for the Falcons. I know we just got this news, Evan, but any reaction to the Calvin Ridley gambling story? No, I mean, I, I I think that um, his tweet is interesting because he's right. You know, I mean, if he only, I mean, you know, he's an NFL player, $1,500 is pocket change. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, he, he has, he isn't, he, he never got the big contract though. Correct. You know, I mean, he was still on his rookie deal. He was set to make what over 11 million this past year, um, or I'm sorry, in 2022. But he never, uh, like, he his base salary never even got to two million yeah. in the seasons that he did play. Um, so he's going to end up losing a lot. I mean, he's losing a lot of money here, man. Yeah. To, uh, and I, you know, I, 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 I kind of feel for him. Um, you know, because he, he didn't, I mean, he bet 1500 bucks. Like that's, yeah. You know, I mean, you know, <laughs> it says the report from Andrew Sicilano says Calvin Ridley placed parlay bets on NFL games using his cell phone. So, you know, mm-hmm. he's a, he's a phone shitter, uh, a, a better, yeah. uh, he's yeah. not even on desktop, like a man he's betting parlays, which of <laughs> course we know have a far worse expectation. So of course, yeah. We don't think Calvin really has a gambling problem. No, he's just he's just trying se. to have fun. I mean, but it's just fifteen hundred bucks in a year is just trying to have fun. Like, I, but again, I get the NFL's point here. You just can't have any sense that NFL right. players are betting on games right. because it just messes the That's entire. That's why him saying that he has he doesn't have a gambling problem, which he almost certainly does not, based on yeah. the evidence. Um, but it's just it's missing the point. It's irrelevant. You know, he, yeah. He's he's missing the point. Yeah. Exactly, 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 exactly. Yeah, and this is going to be a this is going to be a story in the gambling world because this is going to be like you know, 
the face, you know, like people are going to say, oh, this is why we can't have legal betting because Cal really can just go on his phone and bet on Falcons games or bet against the Falcons and tell his players, you know, people are going to go down a ridiculous rabbit hole. That, that's just not true. But, you know, is what it is. I'm, I'm excited to dive more into it, though. These, these stories where gambling and sports intersect, I find so interesting. I, I've, I've read and, and listened and watched so much on the Tim Donaghy thing. Like, I thought it was like so fascinating. But obviously, Cal really thing is nothing like that. All right. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah. Let's go. To yeah, I, go ahead. So, so, some of like some of my friends, hashtag friends, um, <laughs> didn't even know about the Tim Donahue thing. If anybody gets an opportunity, I mean, you want to talk about a rabbit hole? Yeah. It's like, I, I think I've wasted like four days of my life, like, you know, reading stuff or watching videos about Tim Donahue or listening to podcasts with him. Um, that, that's a really interesting story. But yeah, let's let's get on to the important stuff. All right. Yeah, let's get to the stuff that we actually prepared for on the show. First is the Saquon Barkley rumors. Obviously, you know, they get rid of Dave Gettleman and immediately the question comes, oh, okay, now that Gettleman's gone, can the Giants get away from Saquon Barkley? The problem is at this point, there's really not much to get away from. He only has one year left on his contract at $7.2 million. Could they get something for him? I actually think Saquon could help like – a team in like a change of pace or even in a feature back role. Like he could help a good team, I think as part of running back by committee a little bit, but what are you going to give up to get that? Anything more than like a fourth or fifth round pick seems insane to me. What do you think about these rumors? I agree. I'm sure you talked to Jordan about it. Uh, of course, Jordan covers the giants yeah. for ESPN.com. Things are coming to a head, I guess with Saquon or maybe not. I kind of think that the way it plays out is he just sticks with the giants. But what do you think about all the Saquon stuff? Uh, well, one thing that Jordan did say, uh, uh, in, in nothing in regard, uh, was that last training camp, watching Kyle Rudolph, who just got cut by the Giants, he thought that he could beat him in a race. <laughs> it's like, this is one of the slowest players I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, as for Saquon, I mean, you know, we, we talked about it on a podcast recently in, ter- in terms of player evaluation. He's not a, a sustainer running back who breaks off four, five, six yard gains consistently. You know, he's a um, he he has a lot of uh, he, he gets stuffed a lot. He has a lot of negative runs, and this is not just because the Giants' O line is shit, which is which it is, because he was doing this stuff at Penn State as well. Um, you know, that's the way he plays, and he needs to be able to hit those long runs. You're if you pull the long runs out of his repertoire, is he a, even a good running back? I, I would say no, because that's that's you know the, the, what his game as a runner is built on is breaking those long runs. You can live with the stuffs, you can live with the negative runs. If he's breaking you know a sixty yard run every other game, and he can't do that when he isn't healthy, has he lost that ability to put his foot in the ground and get upfield and, and explode? I, I don't know, but I, I haven't seen him do it very often. Maybe the last time that we saw it was at the end of the 2020 season, you remember he finished um, or, or was it even 2019? Yeah. 2020 was the ACL year. Yeah. Yeah. 2020 was the ACL year. So I think it was at the end of the 2019 season. I mean, it's been a while since we've seen Saquon. Yeah. I mean, he wasn't a good, ba- good player last year. No. And, and when you said change of pace back and people think, wow, change of pace back Saquon Barkley, it's not crazy to, to say that, or like even just like a third down back, because I, th- I think he's still a good receiver, yeah. but I don't think he's a very good runner right now. I mean, go to Buffalo and put him with Devin Singletary. The thing is, I don't even think the Bills would give up like a fourth round pick for him, you know? So, and I, what's the point? Like the Giants are going to take such a big PR hit by doing that also. But this is, again, like, I like, I love running backs. I think as humans, they all deserve to get paid. They all deserve to have a ton of draft capital. But when you're building an NFL team, this is what happens. We talked about the Ezekiel Elliott thing. He's a number two overall pick on Saquon Barkley. He doesn't do anything. He's almost out of gas by the time he gets to his second contract. You know, it's like, you just wasted it. I mean, is the bottom line. And so, yeah, sad times for Saquon indeed. I think that one thing that we can say for sure is that in the, uh, the Saquon-Sam Darnold wars, uh, that everyone was wrong. No one so, won. <laughs> yeah, no one won. Them. Uh, speaking of high profile running backs, allegedly on the market, Jonathan Jones, who used to cover the Panthers is now with CBS. He was at the combine and he got word that the Panthers have been fielding calls on Christian McCaffrey. Now, according to this Jonathan Jones article, they're asking for a first round pick plus additional compensation, obviously completely 
ridiculous. But CMC is the kind of back that I think like if I was going to pay a running back in today's NFL, which I wouldn't, but if I was, it would be this Christian McCaffrey, Alvin Kamara type who can catch six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 balls in a game and help you there. Any thoughts on the CMC trade rumors? Well, there was also a report from Jeff Howe and I think Joe Person, uh, Jeff Howe of The Athletic, like a, you know, a national reporter, and Joseph, Joe Person, who has covered the Panthers for a really long time, that the Panthers were fielding trade offers for Robbie Anderson yep. as well. Yep. So it sounds like they're just fielding trade offers for everybody right now. And so I don't know if there's a whole lot substantive here, but mm-hmm. I, I also wouldn't be surprised if either of these guys were traded. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's hard with Christian McCaffrey when you're when you're working on projections and rankings. Christian McCaffrey just looks so much better than every other running back because of the way that he's used. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. But if he was to leave Carolina, maybe that, you know, introduces a little bit more volatility there. I don't think he will, though. And we're going to stick with him number one overall in our rankings. Robbie Anderson. Yeah, he was linked to the Patriots. You know, obviously, Robbie had a horrific, horrific start to last year, came on a little bit late but yeah I, I think that the Panthers likely have some buyer's remorse there on Robbie despite the shower narrative between Robbie and Matt Rule going back to Temple speaking of the Panthers man I mean the David and Joku one I got and it's not a ton of money but Ian Thomas three years 16 and a half million with eight million guaranteed who was paying more for Ian Thomas and like Ian Thomas has been he's not been he hasn't been good as a blocker and forget about as a receiver he's been a complete 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 non-factor so this one was a head scratcher for me I don't know if you have any further insight on the Ian Thomas three years 16 and a half million with eight million guarantee that the Panthers gave him it just wasn't very much money yeah um you know so it didn't bother me um but I mean I I get where people are coming from when they're like well, what the heck's going on here yeah. At the same time, there is a, you know, when you look at like PFF blocking grades and look, I, I use them too. I mean, they're, they're at least give us some sort of a data point, mm-hmm. uh, you know, to use when we're uh, addressing the blocking issues for wide receivers, running backs, what, you know, tight ends, offensive linemen. But uh, there is a big disconnect between the way that teams feel about guys as blockers and the way that PFF addresses them as blockers, particularly mm-hmm. at the skill positions and at tight end. So, you know, I, I know that he probably doesn't have great PFF blocking grades, but I think the team views him as a good blocker yeah. for whatever that's worth. And I don't know, maybe they're just wrong. You know, I, it, it's hard for us to say, Well, uh, but, but there's a big disconnect between, between those things. It's a great point because c- clearly <laughs> – they don't view him as a pass catcher. That's not why he got the money. I mean, the dude right. doesn't even like have a chance to catch passes. I mean, and right. when they were desperate for guys to catch passes, they weren't even using him as a yeah. pass catcher. I mean, it was really bad. Yeah. Let's go to and his, his targets have like declined every yeah. year. Yeah. That he's been in the league. I mean, I, as a rookie, he had 36 catches, you know, I mean, yeah. That's a good number for a rookie tight end. Anyway, so let's move yeah, on. Yeah. And he's an athletic dude. Yeah. But right. it just never came together. Um, I'm sure one of the uh, most common conversations at the combine among executives was this Mitch Trubisky market, because for a guy to go from, you know, kind of a bust or, or a full blown bust in Chicago to barely playing for the bills, all of a sudden now people are talking 10, $15 million a year for Mitch Trubisky. It just goes to show the state of the quarterback position in the NFL. Um, by the way, one of the funniest parts of uh, the Mitch Trubisky thing is somebody one of the executives on the bill said like, Mr. Trubisky is the kind of guy you want to marry your daughter. And so somebody took that tweet and then next to it, put Mr. Trubisky's tweet from like 2011, where it just says, I love to kiss titties. I mean, that, that was an all time uh, tweet. Anyways, Mr. Trubisky. I mean, I don't know, Evan Panthers, Steelers, commanders, giants, Broncos. I mean, someone's going to pay a lot for this guy. I know we've talked about it a bunch yeah. already, but anything new on Trubisky stuff. Nothing new. I mean, he's at the top of the free agent quarterback market. I'm surprised that Marcus Mariota, who's the Mm -hmm. clear number two, I think, on the free agent quarterback market. And some people would say Jameis. Jameis is coming off a torn ACL. You know, he played fine last year, but, you know, and he was also, you know, in a Sean Payton offense. Sean Payton, one of the, the greatest talent maximizers of all time, and really just used him as a game manager. He had some games where he threw a bunch of touchdowns, but... You know, I, he, I think he's he's clearly behind these two. 
um, in terms of how much he's going to get paid, particularly because of the knee injury. And Mm -hmm. I'm surprised that Marcus Mariota has not generated really nearly as much buzz as Mitchell Trubisky, whose agent is obviously doing a very good job right now. But, you know, this is also something that, you know, Daniel Jeremiah was talking about last November that he had heard from NFL executives, not agents, that Mitchell Trubisky is going to get a big deal. Um, I, it, you know, it makes a lot of sense for him to go to the Giants. But as you said, he, uh, you know, the supply and demand is going to dictate that he's going to have better opportunities mm-hmm. than what the Giants can offer him, where it would just be a, a training camp battle between him and Daniel Jones. I think he's probably going to get, Mitchell Trubisky is probably going to get a locked in starting job and like 17, 18 million a year. Yeah. Yeah. Hashtag how yep. rich. I mean, yep. you know, Mr. Trubisky also got a big contract when he was the number two overall pick. I'm not ready to give up on him, of course, just because he failed with the Bears. I mean, this whole Bears franchise, man, it's just it's been a mess for so long that I'm not willing to completely give up on Mr. Trubisky yet. He's still only 27 years old. So I'm excited to see where Mr. Trubisky lands. I know. I know. I'm interrupting the video. Wah. But if you're enjoying this video and want to see more fantasy football, and DFS content like it, please just take two seconds, hit the subscribe button, hit the thumbs up button. Really does go a long way for us and we'd appreciate it. Thank you for watching. And now back to the show. Um, Retirement news. Jack Doyle decided to retire, made that announcement today, March 7th. I've been trying to make Mo Alley Cox a thing for like three years, it feels like. It feels like forever because Mo Alley Cox is just a total freak, particularly in the red zone. I mean, he like towers over opposing safeties corners, even linebackers at times. I mean, he is just an absolute specimen. I know Mo Ali Cox is also a free agent. I assume with this Jack Noyle dues, they'll be trying to get Mo Ali Cox back and your free agency rankings, which are up for free on the site, actually not rankings where you expect them to land in terms of money. Mo Ali mm-hmm. Cox is actually pretty far down among tight ends. What do you think about him mm-hmm. and Indy and anything else from this Jack Doyle fallout? Yeah, he's not super high. I mean, I have him behind guys like Uzoma, CJ Uzoma, you know, of the Bengals, OJ mm-hmm. Howard. Hayden Hurst, but I think that that's the, the, the place where he kind of belongs just because a, a really smart coaching staff, you know, Frank Reich's coaching staff never determined Mo, Mo Ali Cox being worthy of more than being like a rotational part of like a two or three man tight end committee. And, um, you know, I, I, this is another situation where a lot of the PFF stuff seems to be a disconnect between you know, where, where, where their grades and their metrics are on him and where a really smart coaching staff is on him. And I, I think he was around, I don't know, 50, 60 percent of the snaps this past year, which mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's a good amount. But, you know, with only Jack Doyle ahead of him, like I, I think it was disappointing that Mo Alley Cox was, was not able to to secure something bigger. Let's go. Oh, and they also have I just want to mention Kyle Granson because he was a guy last year. I think he was a fourth round rookie that seemed I mean the coaches loved him love and they were talking about so much he didn't get to play a lot as a rookie but with Jack Doyle gone and Molly Cox a free agent like it's at least possible that Kyle Granson becomes a thing I just want to put that out there for people absolutely dynasty leagues um okay let's get to some prospect stuff so this Ekam Ekwanu stuff man he's not the official favorite it sounds like you think he's the favorite though the official favorite is still Evan Neal at minus 110 to go number one Overall, on most books now, Ika McWan, who is plus 200, two to one. As I mentioned before, we actually had 100 to one on Ika. He went to seven to one. Now he's down to two to one. We bet it at plus 350. By the way, we're giving out draft props for free this year. If you guys saw it, be sure you're following us on Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, email. Uh, We will have a capture for that coming soon, just so you guys know. But anyways, we took plus 350. It's down to plus 200 now. How likely do you think it is that Ika McWanu becomes the number one overall pick in the NFL draft? Well, I would consider him the favorite, but I would say that with very low confidence. I think that anybody that's saying that the Jaguars have already decided who they're going to pick at number one is fucking crazy mm-hmm. uh, because the, I, I guarantee you they haven't. Like as of, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we didn't even know who their GM was going to be. Yeah. You know, so you think they've already decided? I mean, no, no, you know, you're no. Um but I, I would consider him to be the favor. It's just, that, you know, and, and also like the Jaguars, they need to trade this pick. Yeah. I mean, there's no clear cut blue chip number one overall pick. They've got their quarterback. Now they need to surround him with not just one left tackle, like 
a bunch of different guys, you know, at a bunch of different positions. They could use help on defense as well. So they need to be doing whatever they possibly can to trade this pick. And it's not going to be easy to trade because of the fact that there's no clear cut blue chip number one overall pick. And they might not even really get any le- legitimate offers, yeah. uh, you know, uh, for, for this because of that fact. And I think that that's well re- uh, accepted, uh, an accepted reality around the NFL that this number one overall pick just, you know, the, the, the prospect does not exist this year, yeah. but they still need to be trying to trade it and they should be willing to take a discount to do that because they need a lot of picks and a lot of help and they got to hit on these picks and they need more picks because they, you, you know, that they're going to miss on some, so they need more to reinforce it. You, you know what I'm saying? So of course, any, anybody saying with any level of certainty that they know who the number one pick is right now is fucking lying. Uh, my take and nobody ever wants to hear it is that like, if I don't need a quarterback, I'm trading back like almost every time, you know, like I'm just like always trading back, trading back, trading back, trading back. Now, if you need a quarterback, I'm trading up or I'm, or if I'm staying there, if I have a high pick and I need a quarterback, the problem for the Jaguars, is they got so unlucky because they don't need a quarterback and there's no quarterback for someone to trade up for in this draft. And that's what Evan means. They're not going to get what you would normally get if you trade out of the number one spot. So yeah, you know, unlucky for the Jaguars for sure. You mentioned getting pieces for him, for Trevor Lawrence. Yeah, I mean, they're getting Travis Etienne. They're getting DJ Chark. Or you get DJ Chark's a free agent, but hopefully they'll get him back. They get Travis Etienne back. Add some players here. Like, I could see it turning around reasonably quickly for the Jaguars. But, yeah, we'll see what they do at the top. I agree that they don't know yet. We took a good price, I think, on Ike McWanu, and we'll continue to monitor for news to see if there's other stuff. You know, stuff gets pushed out. When you take Ike McWanu and the line goes to plus 200, well, now Aiden Hutchinson – it's plus 750 or plus 800 to go number one overall. You know, those things are always moving. All right. One of the other big stories from the combine at the quarterback position was Kenny Pickett's hands. And my God, I mean, I am like so tired of hearing about hands. It's, it's, it's so ridiculous to me, but this guy is an outlier. So I guess I'll, I'll hear it. Eight and a half inch hands for Kenny Pickett after he trained to stretch them out is concerning no NFL quarterback right now, no active NFL starter has eight and a half inch or smaller hands. Of course, Evan has done the bit for years now. Brandon Allen famously had eight and a half inch hands. How bad do you think this is for Kenny Pickett or are people making too much of hand size? He's just going to have to learn how to um, throw the ball with two hands. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> um, no, he's, I mean, I, I do think it matters. I mean, you know, the people that said Ross Tucker made a funny joke on Twitter that, oh, you know, I don't think he'd ever be, able, you know, because of the small hands, I don't think he'd ever be able to succeed in a, in a city, you know, in a cold weather city like Pittsburgh, you know, which is a funny joke because obviously he played at Pittsburgh Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the Steelers need a quarterback, but Mm -hmm. you know, he did have 38 fumbles in his college career playing at Pittsburgh. So not everything was smooth, you know, for, for Kenny Pickett in college and it's only going to get tougher in the NFL. And I I do think that hand size matters. I mean, I think it absolutely matters. You know, a guy like Jared Goff who has nine inch hands. So those are, are still fairly small you know, he has struggled with, with ball security and just playing in cold weather. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so, um, uh, you know, uh, Bales, Jonathan Bales did a, uh, uh, an article on Roto World maybe five, six years ago on the benefits of hand size. Like Russell Wilson has these like massive hands. He's a yeah. small guy, but he has like these massive hands. And Bales like compared it to, uh, you know, think of like when you can grip like uh, those little Nerf balls and you can just fucking launch them, you know, and um, there, there absolutely are benefits to that. Uh, but I, I mean, I don't think it's like no big deal uh, yeah. that Kenny Pickett has eight and eight and a half inch hands. Like it was a big deal in college. Thirty eight fumbles. That's a lot, man. That's, That's a, a lot. lot. Uh, Russell Wilson, among starting quarterbacks in the NFL, Russell Wilson has the biggest hands, 10 and one quarter inches. Current quarterbacks. Uh, with eight and a, current starting quarterbacks with eight and a half inch hands, none current quarterbacks with nine inches or smaller hands, Jared Goff, Ryan Tannehill, Joe Burrow, nine Burrow, inches yep. and Taysom Hill, eight and three quarters. So is what it is on Kenny Pickett. But, you know, I, I do think that as we move to Malik Willis, I, I think that um, this is enough to, for 
Malik Willis to be the odds on favorite. He's currently minus 170 or so to be the first quarterback off the board. Everybody says his on field performance, the combine was great. His interview was great. He went viral on social, like helping a homeless dude or something like that. Current market is Malik Willis minus 170. Kenny Pickett plus 200. Howell and Corral are both plus 1100 to be the first quarterback off the board. What do you think chances are Malik Willis ends up first off the board at quarterback? Yeah, I, I definitely, I definitely think that he will be. Um, and this is a guy that when I was in Indy, there was a lot of people were talking about him a lot. Uh, and this was before the thing that over the weekend where he was, you know, feeding the, the, the homeless guy out of his suitcase and, you know, mm-hmm. had, had done all of his team interviews and all that. And I mean, he's, I, I think he may, as we draw closer, I think he may start to generate some comparisons to Josh Allen because he is an incredible physical specimen who kind of just, you know, the production really wasn't there for him. Like the dominant production in college was not there for him. And you would like to see that as a player at Liberty, but you know, his supporting cast, like none of these, you know, these guys are going to be, you know, not playing, you know, football Mm -hmm. like very, very soon uh, in their lives. And so, you know, didn't have, you know, the supporting cast, but all the tools are there, maybe a little bit, you know, developmental, but, um, you know, he, I mean, he can throw it, he can launch it 70 yards downfield. He's a really good athlete uh, by all appearances. He's a really great kid. And um, I, I think that he's a guy that, yeah, I mean, I, as we move closer, he could be a quarterback that establishes him as maybe one or, or, or two of the quarterbacks that go in the top 10. Yeah. And, and as teams get desperate more and more for quarterback, maybe you see someone trade up for someone like Malik Willis. I, always say, I will say I like the Josh Allen comp from a production standpoint. Malik Willis only measured six foot tall, 219 pounds. I mean, he's not big, especially compared to Josh Allen. I mean, Josh Allen's just an absolute massive monster. And you saw, I mean, when he runs like in the playoffs and stuff, I mean, Josh Allen, my God, such a beast. Let's go to, oh, Brees Hall. So man, I mean, Brees Hall's production in Iowa State was outrageous. I mean, 718 carries, 82 catches in three years at Iowa State, scored 56 touchdowns in 36 games at Iowa State. Looks awesome. Then he goes to the combine, 5'11", 217, pretty prototypical for an NFL running back, 4'39", speed, 40-inch vertical. I mean, what a performance from Brees Hall. I think like almost definitely will be the first running back off the board now and someone that we have to take very seriously in fantasy. I don't know if you've got a chance to look at Brees Hall yet, but I think he's going to be like the apple of the fantasy community's eye before this is all said and done. Any thoughts there? Yeah. And I also think that in a year like this, where it, it does seem like it, it has a lot of the, the draft has pretty good depth, mm-hmm. but in a year like this, and we saw two RBs going the first round just last year, that Brees Hall could be a player that might sneak into the first round. I, I think he's definitely going in the second round if he doesn't go in the first, but I, I think he could sneak into the back end of the first. Yeah, we have him fourth overall right now in our rookie dynasty ranking. Drake London first, Traylon Burke second, Garrett Wilson third, then Brees Hall fourth. If you were in need of running back on your dynasty team, I would not hate moving Brees Hall up. I, of course, prefer to prefer prefer to build my dynasty teams through young wider receivers. But man, Brees Hall looks like an awesome, awesome fantasy prospect. Not awesome fantasy prospect. Evan mentioned it in the last episode. Kieran Williams at Notre Dame. Measures in at 5'9", 194 on the small side. Okay, let's hope he runs fast. He doesn't run fast. 4'6", on this fast track in Indy and 32-inch vertical. I mean, disaster. What do you have to say yeah. about your boy from Notre Dame, Kieran Williams? Yeah, I, I'm, and I'm not totally sur- – I didn't think it would be this bad. I mean, this is really bad. Yeah. I'm not totally surprised that he didn't test great because he's just – he's not like a scintillating athlete. He's really good at the game, though. And I think that the best comp for him right now would be to uh, a, a, another former uh, Notre Dame player in Theo Riddick. Mm-hmm. Theo Riddick would be the sort of player that I think that Kieran Williams will end up being in the NFL. And Theo Riddick at times in his career just got way too much usage, like under Jim Bob Coot, like built the offense around <laughs> Theo Riddick. And you know, that, that's going to be really hard for Kieran Williams to have production like that in the passing game, just from a reception total. But I think that's, that's the kind of player that he's going to be like a third down scat back plays special teams and, you know, is drafted somewhere between the, the fifth and the seventh round. Yeah. I mean, yeah. with that kind of draft capital and that kind of athleticism, we, I mean, we dropped him a lot. We have him as the RB 10 now in fantasy 
in this class. Someone moving up, and I want to uh, end here, but someone moving up is this kid, Pierre Strong, who honestly I had not heard of or known too much about. South Dakota State, obviously an FCS school, averaged over seven yards per carry in his college career among a ton of carries. Also caught 43 balls as a senior, then goes to the combine, 5'11", 207, runs a 4'37", with a 36-inch vertical. I was reading this morning, Tom McShea was saying, hey, Pierre Strong might go round two or round three. Evan, I know you haven't looked at Pierre Strong that much, but this is the kind of player that like, man, you know, small school, uh, draft capital, uh, hopefully will be there and extreme athleticism. Like I'm interested for sure in Pierre Strong. We have him up to RB7 in our rookie dynasty rankings right now, which again are free up on the site. South Dakota State Jackrabbits. Yes. What a program. Okay. That's going to do it for part two of our look at the news, rumors, and measurements from the NFL combine that has wrapped up in Indy. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube or anywhere else, be sure to hit subscribe. It is indeed free. Helps us out a lot. Helps us keep this stuff free for you. For Evan. For Bruce Luke. I am Adam. Good luck, everybody.